My name is Ken McKinley. I've been researching for over 15 years. The usual problems of sort of just trying to cipher records, trying to find records, it's always a bit of a challenge. The websites I've mentioned here can be found on my blog at family, uh, familytreenot.blogspot.ca uh, and the email address is also there. The focus today, I'll be looking at um, two soldiers mainly. Uh, one is Victor Sternberger. He was a soldier in the CEF, and he was wounded during battle in 1918. The other one is Samuel McKinley, who was my granduncle, and he died 1915 in the Great War. So I'll be walking you through the different uh, resources that can sort of help you with your research in finding out about the soldiers that fought for the Canadians. Sometimes you find some British soldiers uh, uh, in some of these records. The British records are a little more of a challenge uh, just because a good portion of those were actually burned. So we're lucky in Canada where we didn't get bombed during the Second World War. A year ago, you only had really one option for finding these records. This is before the Library of Archives Canada digitization. So you had to get a library uh, user card from LAC. Fairly easy, you just went online and you had your card number within two days. So I sent you out to Toronto. That was great. Then you had to order the file. And it's much easier to do it online than actually trying to do it in person and then coming back a week or so later and get it again. Then you had to visit LAC or pay to have it digitized. Usually they could either digitize and pay them, or you hired a researcher. They would stand with their uh, digital camera above uh, each uh, page and take a picture for you. So you could photograph the file, but that was then. Things have changed. And all those pictures we've been showing, that's actually done about a year and a half ago of actually looking up Victor Sternberg's file. And you can actually see his file right there. Now, and you'll see that the, uh, the color around it is blue. Every once in a while you'll see some pictures that the border is red. The border does not specify that it's the conservative government in power. Uh, it just means it's the new pages. The red was the old pages. So we need to start at the beginning. So we go to Library Archives Canada website. And we bring up the search uh, service files of the First World War, 1914-1918 CEF page. Very simple. Most of the time, all we will have is the person's first and last name. If you actually know the person's buried and it's actually a military grave marker, a lot of times you'll also find the service number. If I have the service number, I always search on the service number. It's much easier. But in this case, you're going to type in the name. Victor Sorenberg. We get back, his date of birth is listed, no rank, uh, his regimental number, and a reference. A year ago, that reference information was absolutely critical. That was how you ordered the file. Nowadays, it's a little different. So, you click on the person's name, and that brings you up to the next page. In this case, it is actually an image of the particulars of recruit. And that means he was most likely drafted, 1917 time period. His name, address, date of birth, next to Kim, his wife, can be found there. However, this file has not been digitized yet. They are only at about 12% digitization so far. It's a long process, and they've been having some challenges. But if you are lucky enough to find uh, somebody whose files have been digitized, you'll see on this uh, right hand side of the screen uh, is actually digitized uh, service file, PDF format. Click on that, you can download it. It can be a big file. I think that uh, this one here is for John, ba uh, John Masters Bart, uh, very, very distant cousin of mine, several times removed, no matter, I don't know how many branches of Bart. Double-sided, 
uh, attestation pages there, so you can actually click and download. Same thing with Ancestry. So if you're searching on Ancestry, you come across that attestation page, it's the same pages. But with the service file, you click on that, you'll get a whole bunch of other stuff there in a single PDF. Click on it, walk away from your computer. A little while later, you'll actually have it on your computer, which is nice. I'll be showing what you get using his file in just a little bit. So, the attestation papers in this case is the particulars of recruit for uh, Victor Lund Sornberg. I uh, have his present address. His service act number. That's always a nice thing to have uh, because that number follows him around for all the documents. You can use that number, maybe you come across a nominal role for the regiment, and you can look up that number. Um, his date of birth. I uh, have to remember that no documentation was really needed to prove that that was your date of birth. This is self-given. So there may be some lies that happened here. Uh, for the presentation at Fabisco, we had a really good talk on that, about some of the falsehoods that people could put in there. Maybe they are a little too old, so they lie about their age. Or maybe they're a little too young, and they lie about their age. Or they're American, and they're not allowed to come to Canada to serve, so they lie about where they're born. So take it with a little bit of grain of salt. But this does just touch, just scratches the surface. And a lot of people will stop at this talk and say, okay, I know what I need to know. I'm done. <laughs> No, not even close. <clears throat> so, in the pre-LAC digitization uh, times, why I took this one because, of course, <laughs> his name is Stormberger, he's going to be about a year or so before his files digitized, if we're lucky, maybe two years. <clears throat> so, you get that wonderful wood background in the desk of the LAC. Uh, I can sort of miss that from all the digitization projects. That's right, it's there, so. You get his service uh, uh, envelope for the service file. Read it. There's actually important details on it. In this case, he's discharged as medically unfit. That's a nice little fact to know. That's right on the cover. Oh yeah, and he's deceased on that date. That's not during the war. That's 1952. So the top of it, the outside of the file can be just as important as the inside of the file. So, a lot of documents are in this file. Some of these files may be only one or two documents. Other files, 30, 40 pages. Some, 100 pages in size. It all depends on how many times the person was wounded, how many times in the hospital. Is there an issue with the person's will? Where family members are squabbling about who's to get his uh, allowance. And I've come across that in some files. So here we have his discharge certificate. Description of the soldier. Well, he's according here. He is, I think that's, I think he's five, uh, he's six or five foot one. Hair, uh, com he's complexious, fair, blue eyes, light brown hair. What marks and scars? Um, does have a gunshot wound in the right groin. That's a little bit of a problem. Uh, oh yeah, and this little amputation. It's important to know when the guy was discharged that he had an application, where he was discharged, and his signature. Sometimes that'll be the only clue of that's how that person spelled their name versus how the documents might have spelled their name. Because everybody knows your name has always been that same name for hundreds upon hundreds of years. It would never, ever change. It's interesting when you start getting copies of some of the documents and you find their handwriting and they say, spell your name slightly different. Now you can search for those names. So never get fixated on how a person's name is spelled. Because a lot of times they didn't do the writing. The parish priest or civil authority would be the one writing as they heard it. Next one you'll see is the casualty form. I've done a little bit of cleanup here, but you can still see the wood showing through. The casualty form is not casualty as you think of a hospital casualty as wounds. This is just where the person was. When was he taken on service? TOS. 
when we struck our service, SOS, maybe it will say what ship he was on. When did uh, embark in Canada? Where did he get uh, leave the ship in uh, Europe or England? And on the date, it's the history of the person. Did they go to the field? They'll be written in the field. And you know, let's just say Belgium or just say France because they never knew where they actually end up. So you have all the important details of a person's service history on this form. A lot of times, there'll be, for someone who did a lot of service overseas, it might be three or four of these pages. And there'll be different ones, all for the same period, of information written down. Just because it might be written in the field, then back at the camp, and then back at another location, so you might have multiple copies read each of those copies, and some will be much more legible than others. This one's not too bad. Other ones I've seen, I actually have to use one of the other copies to try to figure out what was that handwriting actually saying. Here, he left Canada on the ship Canada, so nice. He was with the 12th Reserve Battalion in West Sandling Camp. He was taken on strength by the 20th Battalion. Um, he arrived in the Canadian Corps Reinforcement Camp, that's the CC Ren C, <coughs> on uh, June 17, 1918. He then joined the 20th in the field. So, arrived in the field, folks. This is never a good thing. That means there's going to be some fighting happening. That was on August uh, 13th. On the 27th of August, he was picked up by the 4th Canadian and a field ambulance with their wound to his right groin. So, there's that there. A lot of these acronyms can be found through the LAC website. They do have some tables. There's also several projects, great word projects, where you type in the acronym and you try to figure out what did it really mean. Some of these acronyms, you'll look at some. I have no idea. Look at oh, that now makes sense for what was happening at the time. By the 28th, he was brought to the casualty clearing station. So now this is the next step in the process. And August 31st, he was in uh, Whitley in England. That's pretty good speed. And he was wounded on wounded on the 27th. And he's in England by the 31st. This is World War I. That's pretty impressive. When someone was hurt, they would try to move him as quickly as possible for the best care possible. Medical forms, very useful. Uh, details of when he was in Canada, England, and elsewhere, the different theaters he was in. Um, what was the injury? Well, gunshot wound, right thigh injury to femoral vessels. That's a bad thing. Could be worse, could be the arteries, at which point he probably would have bled out right on the field. Uh, and the cause was a bullet wound. Um, usually gunshot wound entails a bullet, so sometimes they sort of state the obvious. Then we get to the gory details. These are sometimes, a lot of times when I'm actually going through these files when I could do so at the library and archives, I would then I take the church, start reading this thing, and I have to sit down and just read the file. Then I have to stop myself because I've been reading the file now for half an hour just because the details were so interesting. And I have to go just back to do the pictures. Otherwise, I'd be there for three or four days just looking at about ten files. So he was amputated below the knee, uh, painful. It's usually not a good thing. Uh, the scar is moderately tender. Yeah. Scars typically would be moderately tender, you know. And you can only walk about a quarter mile with comfort. Wow. Um, I wouldn't be able to walk anywhere actually with any comfort anytime soon. Oh, yeah, and why is actually necessary for the amputation? You can even sometimes find temperature charts. And you can also find dental records in there, too. It's amazing how many, at that time, dentists, you avoided them as much as possible. You join the military, you're going to get a dental checkup. 
and that's always interesting to see some of those files. But here you can see, whoops, temperature 102, not a great thing. They get it under control, and it bounces up to um, around 101, 102, and they finally get it actually under control through the rest of it. So some infection, and the body fighting it off. So you find these types of things in some of the files. You don't find them in all of the files, because uh, these files were stripped out in the 50s of the non-essential information. But a medical record, when it came to pension, was essential information so long as they kept that information available. Now, with the digitization, they've got nice fancy machines. Uh, they don't have to worry about this small digital camera if the person standing over to kind of take pictures. So, this is for John Masters um, Barton, a uh, staff sergeant. He's demobilized, so they've covered off. Then they take a picture of the outside of the folder right, and the back. You never know if there's something on the back. It could be important. Always useful. His attestation papers. And notice that they're actually in color, unlike the ones you'll see in a lot of places like Ancestry. Color is really, really nice to have. Whoops. <laughs> uh, color is nice to have because you can then see the different pens that usually mean a different time period it was signed or a change was made. Uh, at the bottom, there's a stamp, the regiment, and so there's actually Fredericton, is different colors of stamp. That does help out when you're trying to figure out what was going on when. Anytime you can get a colored document versus a pure black and white document, go for the colored documents. Is this your certificate? Same as Mr. Sir Murder, it's the same type of document, but again, there's the nice color you get for the different signatures, and that helps. It is casualty form, and throughout this whole document, it's multiple colors because it's not written at one time, it's written throughout the campaign. Uh, and there's uh, details that are stroked out, changed. He's moved from one to Italian to another battalion. If you are really lucky, you'll actually come across uh, the particulars of family of an officer or man enlisted in CPF. And over here it tells, oh, here's his dad, and he's living, and also his mother, and living. It's always nice thing to know some stuff, and there'll be maybe some other details, like his person married. All these types of dot information help support uh, your genealogy research. One more clue. And of course, you get the service record in a different format. And there's actually additional information on the metagamma. It's sort of interesting because just notice that that's still when my grandmother came on in 1926 to Canada. So you never know what you're going to find. And different locations and what was happening with the dates. And you have two different dates listed. At the beginning of it is when was it reported? And on the other side is when did it actually take place? There may be several weeks difference at times because they're at the front, they're not going to the paper. The captain gets back finally to the camp and he fills in all the paperwork. Or just to his adjutant, a lot of times they said, You fill in the paperwork, I'm tired of doing this thing one day. So you will have a lot of times the difference in you know, by maybe a day, maybe a week or so, on how I'm going to report it when it actually happened. One thing that was a big problem when if you're doing your own pictures at Live Records Canada was the pay sheets. These sheets were about two feet by two feet in size and folded, and very hard to unfold. As part of the digitization project, they flattened them out. These sheets, yeah, the pay is nice, but the nice clue that they have is at the top is, where's the pay going to back in Canada? Is this a sister, a wife, a mother, or a father? And their address. That's the use of the genealogical sense. That's the family ties. Where was mom living at that time? Or where was her, um, 
his wife residing. Oh, she's not residing where they were living before. She's living with her mother, maybe, because she might be raising a young kid. So the pay sheets become very useful, plus how much they were being paid uh, per pay period, which sometimes is not a lot. I think it's $20 uh, per period. But it's useful information, and again, you have his service number at the top, name, the battalion, in this case is the 50, uh, 58th Howitzer Battery, where was the money going to? Um, Mrs. Alice Barton. And there's also information of when pay might be reduced, paying back things, credit slips, and the dates, overpayments, oops, by the way, they give you too much money, they're going to take that money back sooner or later. You will also find a number of index, index cards. If you go to the third floor of LAC, you'll see these big wooden cabinets, all index cards. Well, that's what the hole at the bottom was for. They'd be in one of these card catalogs and they manually flip through it to find the right person. And they'd be indexed in different ways. So you'll typically find three or four of these types of index cards in every file. And it's repeating the information that is available in the file. It's just so they can quickly look up, oh, this is the right person, I now need to pull the service file itself for the exact details to confirm it. And they also include the proceedings on discharge file folder. This is where the guy's been discharged, his papers will be thrown into this file folder. And it'll say, well, in this case, his, um, his Majesty's transport ship Empress of, of Britain is how he came back to Canada. So that might not be on his casualty sheet, but now you find it actually on the proceedings of discharge. Again, more useful information, confirmation. What rank was he discharged at? We got his discharge sheets. All very important to get that little bit of history of the person. But we're only seeing little snapshots. What's needed next, and a lot of times, once I'm sort of looking at, here's the soldier, I gotta go to the next point. I gotta find out about what the uh, unit was actually doing at that time. He was wounded. Why? Did he trip over something? Was he shot? What was the bat? Was there a major battle going on at that time? So the war diaries are digitized as an archive resource on the LIC website. They are not nicely indexed. Um, you, it is fun to search for it. You want to search for like the 20th, to say 20th, uh, for the listing when you're doing the search. They're dry reading. Oh God, they're so dry reading. But it's not to be a thriller. This is for the, the general saying, okay, what happened to the intern at this time with the battalion? It is boring stuff. It's not like a movie. But it sets the foundations that are needed. Gives details of movement, like training, church parade, moving from one location to another. Pretty boring stuff. Now they'll also give details of, oh yeah, we were attacked at this location, we were at this, we were getting ready to do this, we lost this many men. Um, many times, unfortunately, only officers are mentioned by name. The poor enlisted guy who did a lot of work, there was no mention of him. Most of the time. Doing something stupid, otherwise known as something very heroic, then they get mentioned. And I say something stupid because most of the times anybody who wanted to keep their lives preserved, they did not want to stick their head up. But they were doing it for their men, for their comrades. That's the hero. They didn't have to do it, they just did it. And that usually says it all. Months of boredom punctuated by moments of extreme terror. Well, here's a snippet, one of the pages, of the 20th Battalion Canadian Expeditionary Force on the 27th of August, 1918. A lot of action happened. A lot of these diaries will just say nothing happened, or 
church parade on the Sunday. Inspection happened. In this case, 150 prisoners uh, were captured. Now this is during the, the August push, 1918. Getting towards the end of the war, really trying to push. You get all, you had the lieutenants mentioned. Oh, isn't that nice? And they arrived. Oh, that's good. On the 27th, received orders to advance. Jumped off an artillery formation from uh, rake and shovel trenches in support of uh, the 18th Canadian Battalion. So, very important there. You get somebody, where is he? You get somebody who's uh, a private crabtree. I <coughs> really do want to do more research on him one day. This splendid work with his Lewis gun, standing up in full view of the enemy and firing his gun from his hip. This is a 28-pound machine gun. He's fine. Brave, insane, crazy move, but he did it for his men, for his comrades. So you do periodically get mentions of the enlisted personnel. So you learn that they where they reached and the time period. Uh, they were on various trenches. In this case, it was Village Trench. Uh, what would you think the men would be thinking about um, when they found themselves at the front wave of the attack? And these are just kids. 19-year-olds, 20-year-olds, who are going into battle, some of them for the very first time. Sheer panic, terror, but they're going with their comrades. They just have no choice. They go forward. Now, at about 3 p.m., between 30 and 40 low-flying enemy planes came over the troops. Um, they're dropping bombs, firing machine guns. Airplanes are very recent inventions. How many of these kids had ever seen an airplane up to this point? These strange things, you, you shoot your guns at them and nothing happens. Uh, no wonder they might be a little demoralized. So you run to that and start but the effect was demoralized on Ironman and undoubtedly held up the attack for some time. Except these little nuggets you can pull out of these diaries. With luck, it's a major battle, you'll actually come across the operation orders. Now of course at that time this was secret. Very important. Don't let the enemy see that. A hundred years Later, I think we're pretty safe to say it is not secret. But you get the details. What maps to use, 51, the different maps types, the objectives, the boundaries for the battalion, or the battery. Here's the areas you're going to work in. So these were key for the officers. They need to be read up for the, uh, the men, the key parts of it. And from that, you sometimes get really lucky, and you find a map included. Even though the quality here is not great, this is actually the same quality on the copy up from the microfilm. Not a great copy, unfortunately. We're okay. Where is um, rake? Where is shovel trenches? Well, where is this? These towns? Where are the major roads? Very hard to read. <coughs> But there were clues. At the top here, the name we knew was 50, uh, 51B from the operational orders. That can be useful. So let's go to over to McMaster University. They have a collection of trench maps and aerial photographs. The same stuff that the soldiers, the officers, definitely would have with them. And 51B. Right around the middle. So, hey, we're in luck. There's actually some maps for us. Clicking on that square, unfortunately, brings up over a hundred maps. That's a lot of maps to try to figure out which one is yours. And if the map um, does not have an image beside it, it means it's not online. So maybe if, uh, I think it's about a third of the maps are available online. Still, that's a lot of maps to try to figure out and go and look at details. 
And a year ago, I was actually stumped. Uh, of course, that was until I walked out of the talk, went around the corner uh, where there actually had some items from the wars, looked at the map on the table, and there was 51B, which I was actually looking for. It's actually been the commander's map, had been preserved and the private possession of one of the volunteers at the war museum. Black was in my favor at that point, but the pictures I took did not work out. So let's go to the net, another source. If you have not been to the Canadian War Museum, you might want to do so. Because down along the corridors is the, milit is the Military History Research Center. Library, maps, including three-dimensional maps for figuring out, like for the attack of Vimy, what does the other side look like? So they actually know in three dimensions. Uh, I was actually fortunate enough just to, this past week to actually get a tour of the archives and behind the scene vaults. So I think they have an online catalog of the items that they actually hold. That's always a really nice thing to have. Now, a little bit of search. So bring it up. And I'm actually on the advanced screen. The basic screen is just a simple search, but I want to put uh, the two key parts. The name of the map, which I have at the top, and 51B. That's all I need. So, what happens? I actually find, yeah, they actually have that map there. Or I can go there and see it. But they also, in the edition, say sheet 51B. That's good. Oh, SW, southwest corner. Okay, now I have a hope of actually finding the map I want. Instead of going through 100 maps, I don't have to deal with maybe, at the most, hopefully a quarter of those maps. So, let's see what happens. I go back to the master. Now, I look at the uh, 51B SWs. And you have 1917, 1917, 1917, but I'm looking for 1918. The lines kept on changing. New trenches were added, never at all. Well, 1918 for May, 1918 for April. Oh, there's a 1918 for July. Well, that was in August. I want the July one. Oh, there is actually no map available online for July. Okay, but there's May. Maybe. Not all I had happened. Maybe the May one will have it. 1918. Click on that, and I could zoom in right in detail. Just kept on zooming in. There's Shovel Trench. There's Rake Trench. Congrey Road. Okay. Now I have a place. And there's the, the village there. Oh, yeah. And it's in ruins. <laughs> Big surprise. Probably fought over a number of times. And you get the, in the blue, you get the different uh, the lines. This is just showing right now the British side. The whole map actually shows what German trenches they knew about. Unfortunately, the magic word there is knew about. But they had an Earl Reconnaissance. You know, plans to be flying overhead, trying to figure out what the map were, the trend, visible trenches were. Tunnels were unfortunately hidden. But what we knew is tunnels and rays. So, that's probably the area where uh, Victor was probably shot and lost his life. So, where do we go from there? We know that then, what about the now? Can we place him on the ground? Let's make the history living. Because unfortunately what they teach in school a lot of times is names, dates, and place, and they don't put it in the context. They don't put it in the now. Can we see this place? So we need to dig just a little bit deeper. So the war diaries can help you find out more. And we've dealt through that. So use your search engine. Favorite search engine, Bing, Google, Yahoo, whatever you want to use. Search for the names and places you found on the map. Does the Congrey Road actually exist? Well, yeah, but it's not the name which is actually known then. They changed the name. That becomes a challenge. Over the map, I knew some of the villages around the area. 
So let's see what I can find. You might actually find other researchers online who are actually researching those battles. And they'll provide more clues. You're going to have even better maps. As luck would have it, a little bit of digging. There is a convoy road. It's actually National uh, Route National. Um, I think it's number 50, I think it is. But there's the road there. Huh, so those still exist. Using the trench maps, so they're probably somewhere in this area is where he was wounded. This place exists. You can go to France, hop in a car, and drive to that area. It's no longer dead history. This is a real place, tangible, you can actually touch. And sometimes, you'll come across a picture. There's a picture there. And you notice the legs are slightly different. He lost one. But now, you have a face to a name. It's no longer just a name. It's no longer just a service file. Now it's a person. And that's where we want to get to in our history. In the genealogy. You want to put, make it living. Make it a real person. Sometimes in these war diaries, and this one's for the 2nd Battalion CEF, uh, from the from 1st to the 22nd of April, 1915. Boring, 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 boring. They have physical training, church parade. Yeah, whatever. It's routine. Literally, it's routine. Nothing much happening until the 21st and 22nd. Um, and it's the remarks that can be really telling. And in this case, it's a simple remark on the side. Read it out. French allowed Germans to break through on the extreme left of British lines. Okay, French allowed them. Okay, you can go through all those awful jokes, uh, Google searching, uh, French victories, things like that. But you look at the date. You research that. That's the start of the second battle of Eden. Of course, the lines collapsed. This was the first time on the Western Front that the Germans used gas in a mass fashion. They had used it against the Russians, but this was the first time on the Western Front. Now is no longer a joke. We know what happened there. Of course, those lines collapsed. And the reason I know about this record here is that's when Samuel McKinley died. The 22nd or 23rd, they don't even know what date exactly. Because they were rushed up. So, many of them did not return. Uh, of the 30 ships that it took, it's the first uh, division of CEF over uh, England and France, they could have fit all the survivors from uh, in 1919 on one ship. The losses are staggering. So unfortunately, we have the honor dead. These details can be found in the service files. You can also use the Commonwealth War Grace uh, Commission site to find burial details. The Canadian Virtual War Memorial will have uh, additional details. And people can actually put up pictures on there too. And add to the history. You make it living. Ancestry has uh, index and place in line images for the war grave registers and the war and um, the CEF, Commonwealth War Grave Registers. So these are the cards there you can get from Ancestry to provide more information. Where was the person first buried and then was it moved? So in my case, with Sam McKinley, uh, what I found actually from the Commonwealth War Graves Memorial was the company he was in. It actually wasn't listed or can find it in his own in the service file itself. So he's with a company. I actually then found the 1915 novel roles online for that battalion. And yes, there he was in that company. That's actually nice because the novel roles aren't indexed if you can find them. So you need to look for it and go through it. So this helped me with that. Date of death, his age. Where the memorial is, the men and gate. You can then save this or print the document. Very far. Gives you some information. 
And from the Cannon uh, Virtual War Memorial, you get a link to the page for the First World War Book of Remembrance. There's also for the Second World War and other ones you'll have links to the page of remembrance. And maybe any additional details or photographs. So that's the page from the Book of Remembrance. And a little bit of searching, the Menin Gate. And he is just about 10 or 12 from the bottom. His body was never found. There is no grave for him. He's with his comrades. On ancestry, in addition to having those attestation documents, previously reported missing, now for official purposes presumed to have died. He was missing. There's no prisoner of war listed there. He's now presumed dead. And the location, Saint Julien. And also, again, just a different way, and stamp and engage for the more. So you find these documents. Now you can look up what's the history of the gate. Who else is there? Who are his comrades? Yet, not every certain CEF. That's the majority. But if you can't find them there, well, you might want to check if they serve in the Navy. The ledger sheets, the service files. Where are they from Newfoundland? After remember, Newfoundland was not part of Canada. They're a separate dominion. So, but you can find those actually on family search microfilms. Were they with the Royal Flying Corps and then later Royal Air Force? Now, there's some nominal roles at the LAC, at LAC, but not really a lot. You have to go to National Archives England to find that information. Did they serve in the British Imperial Forces? Well, some, they came to Canada maybe in 1909. War broke out. Well, I'm going to go serve with my friends, right, who I grew up in school. So they go back to England and join up with their friends there. Then they came back to Canada. Well, there's actually Imperial War Service for treaty files that are available, uh, actually, Leave their available online, as you see. If not, you can just go to LAC to consult those. There are also veteran death cards. Remember I was telling you about that blue versus the red? This is an archive collection. It's in red. It probably will never get updated. But these are files from up to the uh, early 1960s of the veterans when they died. Useful information. Unfortunately, not all of them are there. There's 100, roughly 160,000 index cards. That is though, a very useful. Now, some of us who could be listed there are the veterans of the CEF. Uh, some of the veterans of the British forces who then came to Canada and they died. Uh, Navy veterans. Uh, veterans of Allied forces. India, French, American armies who died in Canada after the war. Uh, some of the veterans of the Northwest Mounted Police who had a military service. And some of the veterans of the South African War and Northwest uh, Field Force of so the 1885 Rebellion. You might find their death cards, index cards there. And it's arranged like a card catalog. And the names aren't indexed. So you have the fun challenge of digitally flipping through the cards until you find the person you want to find. Unfortunately, I didn't find John Master Barton. Uh, the one before him was George Barton, and there was a, another Barton after that, and it's Joseph, uh, Joseph. John wasn't there, which is annoying. But it does tell you where the person died, the cause of death, when he died, Oh yeah, next to Kim and the address. If you're having a hard time finding this person, you know, maybe you're looking at the ancestry records for Ontario and you can't find a person in the death records there, you can't find a great marker, you might actually find them in the veteran death cards. Or you find something like this one um, for Harvey Ambrose Martin. Imperial. He served with British forces. But he died in Canada. 
and actually gives uh, the guy data death. Useful information. Typically, you won't find British records in mixed with Canadian for World War I. This is one of those exceptions. Came to Canada. So, some of the resources which I make use of. Library Archives Canada is the obvious one. Commonwealth uh, War Grace Commission, wonderful site. I've used that World War I and World War II service files to identify here's the marker. Um, a lot of times they'll have actually pictures of the marker. So if you can't get to Sicily, like I tried to actually see my other grand uncle who died in World War II, there's actually a picture of his marker right, in Sicily. That's nice to see. Ancestry, great question. Internet Archive, you may come across the nominal walls for the different regiments and battalions there. There'll be a book format. Not indexed, but oh, he was with the 20th. Is there a nominal role for the 20th? He was with the 2nd Battalion. Is it available for 1915? Now you can go through and actually see, is he listed there? You have the service number, I can find it there. Maybe all you know from oral history is, yeah, Granddad served um, the First World War with the 2nd Battalion. Okay, you have his last name, first name. Is that battalion reference to a normal role available? Maybe on the Internet Archive. And he said, yes it is. Now you can go through page by page, you find a person's name, and there's a service number. Now you can go back and search on the service number. Maybe they spelled his name wrong in the database. Maple Leaf Pro Legacy Project. CEF Research, great uh, website for doing some research and find out those hard to answer questions and the answers for those. The World War I trench maps at McMaster University and Military History Research Center and all is a great resource. Um, if you want to know how to take care of your uh, carrier pigeon, uh, they do have the field manual there for that. Uh, all the way to, you own a T-54 Russian tank? Not a problem, we have the service manual. It came with the tank. Those are available. Unlike Library Archives Canada, which is a library loan of last resort, basically, if you can't find a copy anywhere else, then you can ask us for it. The Military History Research Center participates in the interlibrary loan program. So if you're out of town, <coughs> you look up in the catalog, this is the book I'm looking for, you can actually request through your library to have it sent to you. Uh, for a couple week period to actually uh, read. That's always a nice thing to have. 